Cool. So forgive me if um, things are a bit rusty initially. This is my first time doing a presentation at a conference with an audience this big. Um, so I'm going to be pretty excited. Uh, so like Priya said, um, we were early adopters of uh, Kubernetes. Um, and we've kind of migrated from AWS uh, to GCP over time. Um, we never existed in AWS and GCP kind of simultaneously. We kind of did a fairly quick cut over there. So I wouldn't characterize this as multi-cloud today. We are definitely multi-cluster though. Um, and we're moving between like uh, cluster technologies. So we started in, um, in GCP, we have our own tooling called Teraflop, which I would love to open source one day. Um, but it basically builds clusters that aren't GKE clusters. Um, we are moving away from that um, to uh, using GKE directly. Uh, so we do have two flavors of Kubernetes clusters that in some ways are kind of as different as um, maybe uh, like AWS, AKS might be um, and, and GKE. So uh, yeah, Kubernetes. Um, this is the tool that we built and we'll talk about, uh, we'll talk about it. Um, so brief background again. Um, so I work for a company called Planet. Um, we have the largest Earth imaging um, fleet of satellites in the world. So we've got 300 of them up in space right now. Um, they're about like yay big for the most part. Uh, they're called CubeSats. Um, started off as um, kind of like a research project with some folks at NASA and eventually grew up into this company that we have today. Um, it's kind of cool, like they all kind of form a ring and rotate around the poles. And as the Earth rotates during its daily orbit, um, they kind of scan the planet like a line scanner. Um, and then we kind of stitch all the imagery together and every day we image the surface at a resolution of three meters per pixel, if that means something to folks. Um, I guess it's like the smallest object we could resolve would be about three meters big. Um, so we can't really see people like on the beach or anything like that. Um, yeah, and um, like I said, we've been in Kubernetes uh, since 2017. Um, we started in AWS. Uh, we brought up our clusters using um, kind of a combination of CloudFormation and some Python tooling. Um, so we've been like strong proponents of infrastructure as code, configuration as code, as long as we've been doing this. Um, definitely like trying to avoid situations where we're going into GUIs and like, you know, pressing buttons to create clusters and things kind of get out of sync over time. Um, and I am a staff engineer on the Kubernetes team. So when we were in AWS, I was working on the tooling that deployed our Kubernetes clusters in AWS. Um, I worked, uh, with uh, Nick Cope at Upbound um, on the tooling that did it in GCP, and now I'm working on getting us migrated over to GKE because as cool as Teraflop is, we don't want to have that maintenance burden of kind of maintaining our own Kubernetes deployment technology. Cool, um, so what were we looking for when we, when we built this uh, deployment tool? Um, so Kubernetes, like, it really helps with um, like a lot of the challenges that we saw. So um, like I said, we're really strong proponents of configuration and a lot infrastructure as code. Um, so we basically want all of our microservices um, to be described in revision control, um, how they're deployed, um, you know, what they're, basically their Kubernetes manifests. Um, we want those all in revision control. We don't want folks going, uh, doing kube cuddle, cuddle edits uh, directly on resources. Um, although we allow that, it's like a sort of an escape hatch in case of an emergency, for example. Um, we also uh, um, wanted to do, we do secret management and revision control, so <laughs> they are definitely encrypted. Um, and this is kind of nice, like, when you, when, you put the, when you have this kind of combination of like, you know, your uh, configuration, your infrastructure, your, your secret management and code, um, if, you go, if you need to go and stand up that application, um, you're not chasing down like some external uh, secret store. It's all kind of self-contained in um, an individual project's repository. Um, and then that kind of leads to this other thing is so different projects have different repositories where development takes place. Um, we don't have a mono repo at Planet. Um, we kind of messed around with Bazel for a while and uh, sort of gave up on it. But from like my perspective as the, one of the engineers that's running like our Kubernetes clusters, I don't want to have to go and chase down um, people's deployment artifacts in like the 50 or so repositories, probably more, um, that we currently have. 
Um, it's really nice for me to have this like single view into all the services that we've deployed. Um, and we kind of do that with this effectively like a configuration mono repo. Um, Kubernetes helps kind of orchestrate that for us. So when you issue an, a deployment, we're actually creating um, a commit to this repo on your behalf or on your pipeline's behalf. Um, and that lets you do really cool things. Like sometimes you're just looking for inspiration, like how is this like service set up its readiness probes? Um, you can just go and like rip grep, uh, you know, through that repository for like readiness probe and see how they've done that. Um, that really helps with like information sharing. Um, I think it's like with deploying things in Kubernetes, there's this headache of like I have to swap all this context in about like this um, like Kubernetes resource API that can be kind of daunting at first, like deployments, services, ingresses. Um, it's really nice to have um, something to get you started there. And then for us, it's just really nice to audit. Uh, disaster recovery, so by having everything in revision control, enforcing that every time you make a change to the cluster to your deployment manifest that they go into revision control. Um, if we ever need to go and spin up a new cluster because maybe the etcd instance that's backing our Kubernetes cluster just got totally fried, um, all three of them, all five of them got fried. Uh, we can go and like bring up a new cluster um, and quickly deploy the applications that need to be running in that cluster uh, once we bring it up. Do. Uh, and then provenance, I, I kind of touched on this. So um, by having uh, all of our operations kind of go through Git, uh, you get all the niceties that you get with Git. Like I can do like a Git diff between like um, two commits and see, oh, like they changed their labels on this day. And maybe one of those labels took that service out of its like uh, service rotation. So that could be really cool. Um, you can also like, yeah, just like Git log works. Um, uh, yeah, Git is great. Simplified multi-cluster deployment story. So this is sort of our, uh, our touch point with like the like multi-cloud con as well. Um, the way that you um, specify which clusters you're going to deploy to with our tool, it's really just like an array of cluster IDs. Um, we handle all of the authentication behind the scenes authorization uh, for getting uh, resources pushed to those clusters. Um, I'll touch on this later. Um, it is really just like an array. We're not doing anything too clever around orchestrating like if you go and remove um, like one cluster uh, from this array, we don't do anything smart like delete it and um, you know drain traffic. That is still kind of a high ceremony event that um, I would probably be involved in uh, helping teams uh, kind of orchestrate that. Um, so probably many of you are like you know wondering like why did we go and like build this? Like there are things out there like Spinnaker, there's Helm, um, Helm three recently came out. Um, so like, why did we go and do this? Well, one of the answers to that question is we built this about two years ago when a lot of that tooling was uh, less mature. Um, and that's probably one of the major ones. I think actually like um, hearing some of the talks today and like even like a week ago, Helm 3 came out. Um, I think the landscape has changed quite a bit, but yeah, we can get into that. Um, so yeah, some of the alternatives. Um, the top link, um, I don't know if my slides will be shared, but that describes sort of what effectively became a tool called Customize. Um, and that doc is a link to the RFC uh, for that tool. Um, it's actually kind of like an interesting bit of like, you know, Kubernetes, uh, like RFC, uh, like how that process kind of goes down. Um, it's just really well documented. I think there's like some really great ideas in there. Um, we might not have agreed with all of them, but I think um, it's kind of interesting just to read it and see that there's these common pains. Um, I guess like briefly, so one of those common pains is um, once you start having um, you know, your Kubernetes resources uh, you know, described with YAML files, you quickly kind of have this temptation, or need rather, to um, customize them for like specific environments. So you don't want to go and like have a fork of your YAML files for like your development machine, for your staging environment, for your production environment. Oftentimes, like most of the details are quite similar and you're, for example, using different CPU requests in one environment. You have a slightly different um, ingress resource in another. Um, copy passing those things would be kind of um, a nightmare. So Customize provides a templating solution uh, for this, um, as does Helm, um, and we made our own choice. Uh, we use JSON it in, in Kube release. Um, the second bullet there, Weaveworks, uh, they're kind of like thought leaders uh, in the GitOps space. 
uh, and they have a product called uh, Flux CD. Um, so that one's actually evolved quite a bit over time. Um, I think that would also be worth checking out again. Um, honestly, can't remember exactly why we didn't choose it two years ago, but um, <laughs> it's definitely evolved uh, quite a bit over time. Um, Helm, so Helm was definitely on our radar. Um, we were kind of uncomfortable with like the notion of Tiller as this component that sort of breaks our back, um, has funky limitations, like it manages like its state and config maps in its own namespace, but if you have two deployments with the same name, they conflict with one another. Like funky things like that um, made us uncomfortable with using it. Um, plus the templating language is like basically Golang templates that splat out into a YAML file, um, so they kind of have to be they're not contextually aware at all. They're basically, you're just outputting strings into a document that happens to be structured as a YAML file. So you'll see funky things like, um, in order to make it correct, you have to indent your like output so that it matches what the YAML indentation level would have been. Um, if folks have used Helm, you're gonna be familiar with this, otherwise that probably sounds totally insane and it is as funky as it sounds. Um, Spinnaker, so Spinnaker, uh, we actually put in like a pretty serious effort to, to look into Spinnaker. Um, at the time when we were looking at it, it was sort of clear that they had transitioned from this product that had been designed for things like managed instance groups or um, yeah, like MIGs in like AWS. I'm confusing my terms now because that's the GCP term. <laughs> but um, the transition from that to you know, kind of overlaying their model on top of um, like Kubernetes deployments so there was, it felt like there was like a slight impedance mismatch um, there that um, like they were just sort of getting over their like Kubernetes implementation had also I think basically been in transition from um, like kind of a V1 to this V2 model. Um, so that kind of gave us some concerns. We also didn't want to necessarily have um, the complexity embedded in what would then become Spinnaker pipelines. Um, so one of the things that um, gave me pause was I like, wanted those to also be um, describable um, in sort of a, a configuration as code methodology. Um, and didn't quite seem to have that at the time. Um, so uh, I've kind of talked about like, what we were looking for, um, and now I'm gonna describe like, what it is that we, uh, that, we, that we built and how we pieced it together. Um, so Kube release like, effectively is um, us putting together various pieces um, that already exist and composing them into an opinionated toolkit for doing our uh, deployments at Planet. Um, so I mentioned secret management um, and encrypting secrets and revision control. We do that with a tool called SOPS. Um, SOPS is pretty great. You know, you SOPS edit a file, a YAML file, it'll transparently decrypt it for you and you like Vim right quit, it'll encrypt it. Um, you can use different KMS systems. So we use Google KMS. Um, you could also use like GPG keys. Um, the experience is pretty slick um, and it has like, yeah, it has integration points with various uh, key management services, um, which is super, super handy. Um, so yeah, Google KMS, um, we're kind of opinionated on how we structure this. And again, KR um, kind of encodes our organizational practices into basically its defaults when you use it. So um, we have a single project that has uh, a key ring, and on that key ring are per application keys that we generate when you register your service with us. Um, one of the reasons for having like a single KMS project is just like ease of management for, for our group. Um, we need to be able to like, for example, assign our deployers the ability to basically decrypt um, any of the application keys that it need to. Now, that's kind of a, a fairly powerful permission to have, um, want to have that project kind of locked down, so only like a select few can do that. Um, so that kind of led to having um, that single uh, project for, for a KMS key. Um, GitLab jobs, so when you actually um, conduct a deployment with the tool, uh, that actually runs inside of GitLab CI as a job, which is pretty great. Um, we didn't want to go and like build our own UI around this. We didn't want folks to you know, effectively be running kubectl apply from their laptops because you don't get visibility into when like, folks necessarily did that, um, among other things, but like, we want to have kind of like some record of like this deploy ran at this time, here's the output from that deploy job. Um, and you get that with, you get that with GitLab jobs for free. Um, it also contains basically a Python click-based uh, command line interface. I'm getting um, into some of the details here. Um, 
Click is cool. I, I don't know if folks have used this. Pretty much in every language that I write code in, I want to have something that's like click, whether it's like Cobra or Kingpin and Golang or yeah, click in, in Python. Uh, makes it really easy to like build out um, just like um, command line interfaces. And there's a Python Flask-based API server. So when you issue a deployment, um, we basically will foist or will hoist, sorry, <laughs> your, uh, your, the contents of your deploy folder um, into the GitOps repo. And we do that by talking to the API server, which kind of then uses the GitLab API to do um, repository manipulation um, in kind of the, our opinionated manner. And um, Python cookie cutter to provide some application scaffold. So I mentioned about like how you know it's nice to be able to go into like um, our um, kind of mono repo and like examine like other people's like um, deploy manifest just to get inspiration. Um, one of the other things that kind of helps people get bootstrapped and up and running is we like have some tooling to you know create a simple like HTTP service. Um, and I think that's like one of the main draws for things. That's one of the draws for tools like Helm is like people do just want to be able to Helm install things. Um, I think this cookie cutter uh, basically scaffold that we provide, I mean, it, it's pretty simple, but it does actually provide a lot of mileage. And I think it like, does keep, give you this warm, fuzzy feeling when you go and um, bootstrap a new uh, service using this tool. Cool, and we'll go through some of these moving parts. Okay, so um, one of the things that we uh, ask our developers to do um, when, we, when they create their service is to write this deploy conf. Um, I was told there's a laser here. Sweet. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah. So this, kind of, this is the name of your service. Um, this is the strategy. So this is the templating language that you're going to use. Um, we typically um, advocate for JSON. It. We do offer uh, Jinja templating as well because some folks just find that easier. Like if you've already deployed, if folks had already deployed their services before we create a kube release, a lot of them were using YAML. Um, so it was easier for them just to use a, a Jinja strategy with, um, with their YAML files. Um, this little bit right here is cool. Uh, this maintainers array lets you um, specify the folks that should have access to deploy the service and also to uh, decrypt the secrets files that um, that are you know contained within your deployment manifests. Um, so at registration time, we'll kind of like enforce that you are actually a member of the group that you specify here. Um, and then um, yeah, and then anybody that's like typically this is like a Google group, so we use Google Groups um, for our various teams. And if you're a member of that team, then you have access to that service. Um, and again, we'll like create a KMS key on the key ring for you. Uh, during the registration. Um, just because of like where this happens to sit, um, so this is like totally unrelated to deployment, but kind of by virtue of having uh, every service uh, specify this file for us, um, we did like a few drive-by additions of metadata, like, oh, wouldn't it be useful if like you also specified an open API schema? Maybe we could surf surface that um, in a bit of a service catalog. Um, so yeah, we ended up like doing that, and I'll we'll see a quick screenshot of that in a moment. Oh, and I said it was not shown, but I actually modified the screenshot. So um, we do have this array of clusters that we deploy to. So that is effectively our um, quick tool to get uh, multi-cluster deployments going. Uh, cool. Okay, so GitLab merge requests um, pay, play a major um, part in this. So when you issue deployment. Uh, we create a merge request with your change set. Um, that merge request then also has um, a GitLab job that will run against it. If the deployment succeeds, we merge the merge request into the master branch. Um, otherwise, it will remain in kind of an open state. Uh, and it's up to the deployer to go and kind of like investigate and see why the service did not deploy um, successfully. Uh, the merge requests, uh, so we're, we're using the GitLab API to do this, um, so shout out to the GitLab folks. Their API is pretty slick. And uh, yeah, we, like, we, we label them according to like, a few bits of metadata, like the cluster it was deployed to, the, um, the org, the, what's that, that's the service, and then what we call the tier, I believe. Um, tiers, there are, we, we sometimes don't like overloaded terms at Planet, and like environment felt overloaded. So we decided to come up with our own nomenclature here, but you can just think of this as like end staging, for example. Um, but you can do cool things, like you can filter this UI by you know, just clicking on these labels, and you can see all the deployments that went out for a particular service. 
um, and quickly browse that. Uh, so here's an example of our JSON at uh, templates. Um, uh, da, da, what's of note here? Um, we do have kind of an internal library of like helper macros that provide kind of sugary wrappers around um, like Kubernetes resources. So those are exposed through these uh, like helper libraries. Um, we're actually using something called JSON at Bundler uh, to vendor this library and then you know, manage it like using semantic versioning. Um, JSON and Bundler is like, there's not a ton of like activity on it, but it actually does what we needed to do here. Um, so that like works okay. I do kind of wish that like the vendoring story was a bit better, um, but it's sufficient. Um, you can see here, so this is how you then access your values and your secrets uh, within this template. Uh, typically what you do with the secrets, for example, is you just shunt this into a, a secret, um, a, a Kubernetes secret resource. Um, and then you, you know, you'd write your like, secret, secret key refs and, and what have you. Uh, the KR metadata provides uh, metadata about the deployment so you can introspect which cluster you're deploying to. Um, potentially, you know, maybe you've got some kind of like, workaround that's cluster specific that you have to apply. I don't think we have any of those at this time, but um, it, you can get like, useful information out of, out of there. Um, yeah, and then this is pretty much like, you know, uh, there's like the ability to check if like, a key exists. You can do string substitution and interpolation, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, I haven't shown like for loops over here, but um, if folks aren't familiar with JSON it and they're looking for an alternative to like, let's say Jinja and YAML, um, I felt pretty good about using it. Um, here's an example of one of those merge requests and like the kind of diff that you might see uh, during a deployment. Um, and here's an uh, example of a GitLab job log for um, a deploy job. Um, this output isn't super verbose, um, but you can see here, for example, uh, we basically, effectively what this is just doing behind the scenes is typically issuing a kubectl apply, um, and then it'll do a rollout wait to see if that deployment achieves stability. There's a configurable TTL, so you can tell it to wait up to five minutes uh, in this case, and if it times out, then you know, something has gone sideways potentially with the deployment. Um, and we're using trigger variables here to basically get parameterized uh, GitLab jobs. Um, that's kind of a, I found that wasn't like super ergonomic to, to figure out, but yeah, it eventually worked. <laughs> so yeah, um, if folks have uh, played, with, played with that functionality um, in GitLab. Uh, and here's kind of like the UI that we kind of, you know, quickly built this kind of like a hack week project or a hack day project for uh, taking that deploy conf metadata and surfacing it. So I'm looking at a single service here, but um, you can see the list of maintainers. If I click on this, it'll take us to the Google Groups page for that group. Um, that's kind of helpful, like if I'm curious, like if we onboard a developer uh, for a new team and why don't they have uh, access to their secrets, like are they a member of their respective Google group and what Google group is that? Um, this makes it quick to navigate. Um, if you click like you know this, for example, it'll take you to the source code for the repo. Um, and depending on the metadata that you specify, you'll get different um, uh, buttons here for like dashboards, logs, um, run books. Uh, the actual repo itself um, has this GitLab CI uh, .yaml file, and this is basically this is the the, the this defines like the triggered or the trigger job. Um, there's a, a command in the, um, in the CLI that'll bootstrap any repository and turn it into a kube release compatible GitOps repo. Um, and one of the things that it does is it splats out this file for you. Um, doo -doo -doo. Yeah, and what's not shown here in that bootstrap script is we'll also configure the repository with um, the necessary um, like environment variables uh, for the runners that basically build off of it to have um, necessary permissions to uh, deploy to the clusters that we allow folks to deploy to. Um, this repo is like typically locked down. Um, only a few folks like, can like, view the repository and, um, or have admin access to the, the secrets because there's some powerful secrets in there. Um, this screenshot could have been a bit better, um, but this is, uh, this is the list of services. Now, the interesting things are when you click inside of here, you can see the JSON file. Uh, and you can also see the like, environment-specific folders. Um, that we're opinionated about that contain um, your per environment values and secrets files um, that will like end up overlaying for you. 
Um, but yeah, this is kind of like an example of like, you know, there's uh, this folder structure now, and um, just having this is, is nice. Um, you can go and this is kind of like our single pane of glass. Cool, uh, so wish list. Um, like, what do we wish this tool could do for us? Um, so one of the things um, that we're doing, um, so DNS management, um, so I said we're, we deploy to multiple clusters. Um, we don't simultaneously currently route traffic to deployments that exist in multiple clusters. So uh, one of the last mile steps of, let's say, migrating from one cluster to another um, is uh, updating your DNS records to point you to the cluster ingress. Um, Kubernetes could do that. Um, it currently doesn't, so there's this out-of-band step that you have to do during a migration to, uh, to do that um, manually um, via like our, uh, the, the DNS tooling, um, which in our case would be GCP's uh, cloud DNS. Um, better logic for resolve it, resolving the uh, cluster addition and removal. So again, um, if you remove uh, like a cluster ID from that array of clusters, uh, we just stop deploying to it. We don't actively go and like reconcile it and say, oh, you removed it, that means you want to delete the service. That's kind of a high ceremony event. And delegating less state to GitLab. Um, so one of the things that we're doing too is like a lot of like the information about the services exists in these deploy comps, the merge requests are used as a, kind of a locking mechanism. So if you have already an open merge request for your service, we won't let you deploy to it with current deployments. Now, that's not really a proper semaphore. It just happens to work because of the, you know, we're not issuing um, thousands of these uh, requests, um, these deployments per second <laughs> or anything like that. So it happens to work, but you know, if we had like Redis, for example, we could actually create like a proper lock there. Um, it would also, uh, you know, facilitate some more kind of navigation of the um, the API resources that we have. So like. Right now, when we get those deploy comps, um, when I do that service catalog view, it's actually just like loading it all um, from basically the repository. It's reading the files, and then eventually it'll cache it, but that could be a bit quicker. Um, so convergence. Uh, convergence is actually like a pretty important topic um, in this whole thing. So um, when you've got your people um, deploying with uh, this kind of like GitOps mindset, but they also still have the ability to kube cuddle edit, um, you kind of want some way to guarantee that what actually is in version control is like the like true state of what's in the cluster. Um, there are tools like kubediff that can kind of help um, figure out like what is actually specified in like um, your rendered manifest versus what's in the cluster. Um, but we don't currently use those. So um, generally, this hasn't been a problem. Like uh, folks are good about only deploying with the tool that we've given them. Um, but maybe you're firefighting one day and you decide to like increase a CPU request and then you don't commit that back into version control. That would potentially get clobbered the next time you deployed. Um, one of the things we could do, for example, is to take away like the permissions from folks to do like kubectl edits, but we felt that that would be um, kind of a draconian choice at, at Planet, just how, given like how <laughs> this is the size of our organi organization and how our teams uh, function. Uh, and canary deployments. So it'd be great if uh, there was a better story about canary deployments. Um, you know, for example, you want to like bleed traffic over, uh, you know, slowly to your next revision. We don't automate that in any way. Um, I think like maybe the right way to do this would be more of like a custom resource definition route, which would then be, uh, which would specify what your canary deployment looks like, and that would be pretty static. Um, I don't want to bring like a bunch of state into KR and like build complex pipelines around orchestrating those if that could be avoided. Um, so would we still build Kubernetes? And my thinking on this has uh, really sort of evolved even over the past week. Um, I think it's been really quite successful um, in all the things that we wanted it to do for us. Uh, we did get, uh, we've had over 10,000 deployments. Um, it's got 100% adoption in our product engineering group, so everything that's deployed is deployed using this tool. Um, we're only deploying to eight Kubernetes clusters. I heard 20,000. I thought eight was going to be a nice number, but then somebody said 20K, so <laughs> it's, it's still a good size. It's, a, it's enough to kind of like, you know, force you to face this problem of multi-cluster deployments. Um, and we're always able to answer questions like, you know, when was the service last deployed? What changed between deployments? So like those kind of niceties you get out of GitOps, um, we achieved. Uh, cool. So, 
I think like it'd be worth taking another look uh, personally at um, Helm 3 these days. Uh, Flux CD um, would be an interesting alternative. I think like fundamentally, like KR is still kind of encoding some organizational practices, like you know how we do secret management, um, how we manage KMS keys, um, that are kind of specific to, to Planet. And it's nice that we have a tool um, instead of no tool around that. Um, so yeah. Amazing. And you said this was your first big talk. You are totally a pro, right audience? Didn't he just nail it? Woo -woo. Thank you. So would you like, I know we're like almost at time for the panel, but maybe we could take a couple of questions. Yeah, for sure, the yeah. Audience is down. Welcome questions. All right, I'll start with you and then I'll find whoever else. <laughs> Have you tried Argo CD? Are you familiar with this tool? Um, Argo CD is sort of like a DAG, uh, Golang-based pipeline building thing, or... Well, it's like... Oh, continuous develop, development. You know, I think that might have been uh, on our list of like tools to check like a couple years ago even, but no, I haven't. I didn't personally investigate that one. Yeah, I mean, it has quite a lot of features that you've built. Yeah. There, and uh, it's used by uh, folks that uh, into it. Yeah. Definitely worth checking out. Uh, I think. Uh, second yeah. question, just a quick one. Go so, mono repo versus multiple repos. Why? Why mono repo? So, we ended up with this hybrid approach where, like, teams can still do development within their own repositories. Um, so, like, when I commit my um, deploy artifacts, I do it within my own repository. I don't do it in our kind of mono repo uh, GitOps. Uh, repo just because like so from my point of view it's easier for me as like the person that manages Kubernetes clusters to have that single pane of glass for me as a service owner I don't want to have to go into this other repository that I don't really manage and like at the end of the day I'm not super opinionated on so I want my deploy artifacts to live in proximity to my, my source code as a service owner as a cluster administrator I want that um, like mono repo so that it's easier for me to go and like let's say deploy everything um, that used to be on one cluster to a completely different cluster. Um, so, yeah, so we kind of have a hybrid approach there where um, we help shunt your data, your deploy artifacts into like the, the GitOps repo, but you still do your development within like your, your local service repo, if that makes sense. Yeah. Any more questions? Um. All right then, cool. cool. Well, my favorite line from uh, your talk was, by the way, environments is a loaded term. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Jacob.